Welcome to Innovation Dialogue. I'm Diana Day, and today we have a special guest, that is Mr. David Wu. He it was the first Chinese American congressman in the United States. It's Thank a pleasure you. to be with you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yes. So, you were from immigrant from Taiwan, right? Yes. Yeah, tell um, us we, something. And what brought your family to the United States? Yes, we came to the United States uh, from the age of seven. Uh, at, at my age of seven, mm. and uh, my family uh, had wanted to come for a while. Um, my father and mother uh, went to Taiwan in 1949. Actually, in 1946. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, and they had no intention to uh, uh, live in Taiwan for the long term. They had wanted to return to Suzhou, where the family is from, but after the revolution, they couldn't uh, go back. Mm -hmm. So um, they wanted to immigrate to the United States, uh, not having ever intended to stay in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But it was a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. So uh, why you became an elected official? Well, I had always known that public policy makes a difference in people's lives. Uh, my parents met because the Japanese invaded China. And every time the Japanese advanced, you know, uh, Chinese moved everything back. And my mother's college was in the hinterlands, and my father's college was in Suzhou. And finally, when the, that college was moved into the hinter, hinterlands and the two colleges were merged, that's how they met. Um, and after the war was over, uh, my parents wanted to go to Taiwan for a few years. And they did, but they couldn't come back because of the revolution. Now, those are big public policy decisions driving big events. Mm -hmm. uh, a war decided in Tokyo, mm -hmm. a revolution decided by two political parties. Mm -hmm. But the next stage of our family story and my personal experience showed me that the smallest of public decisions uh, make a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to come to the United States, but unfair immigration quotas uh, could, did not permit us. Only my father could come. And my mother and my sisters and I had to stay behind in Taiwan. And after John Kennedy's election, he changed American immigration law by executive order. Mm -hmm. And within six months, uh, we got a chance to come to America. Mm -hmm. So big public policy decisions like wars and revolutions decided by large groups of people, they make a huge difference. But even little changes make a big difference in individual lives. And knowing that in my heart, that these things make a difference, uh, when I had an opportunity to uh, go into public office, um, I wanted to do it because I wanted to have a chance to make a positive difference in other people's lives. You did. Actually, you became a congressman uh, from 1999 to 2011, seven turns. Yes. Right. Yes. So what's the, the most, uh, you know, during your turn, and what are the things that make you proud today? Well, um, there are things that affect the APIA community, and there are things for the general uh, American society. And for uh, America uh, as a whole, uh, I got an appropriation that uh, funded research mm -hmm. that may create the first treatment mm -hmm. and vaccine for AIDS, mm -hmm. and that could change uh, life for a whole lot of people in the United States. I also helped create uh, a national park, mm -hmm. uh, and that will be there for as long as uh, America is here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, sometimes uh, you can do things that are more local. Um, uh, there are hazards of uh, tsunami on the Oregon coast, mm -hmm. and I, legis I passed legislation mm -hmm. to help mitigate that risk in coastal California, Oregon, and Washington state. Mm -hmm. uh, for the APIA community, uh, people, you, I'm sure, remember Wen Ho Lee, and yes. perhaps many yes. people do. Mm -hmm. And he and was... Sherry, yes, so many, yeah. Well, with respect to Wen Ho Lee, the situation developed uh, in the Department of Energy. And when I drilled down and looked into it, it turned out that there was a perception among many minorities that there was discrimination at the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, African Americans felt that way, Hispanics felt that way, Asian Americans felt that way. And I passed legislation so that DOE, the Department of Energy, would have to uh, file an annual report with the US Congress that there is no discrimination going on, that they were making further progress uh, about that. Have you or your family experienced this discrimination? 
You know, um, I, I have a very positive outlook, um, and uh, we lived in wonderful communities, uh, and I don't recall a single instance when uh, I faced discrimination personally or I observed uh, that in our family. I know that that is uh, not necessarily a common experience, but that was mine. And, you know, that uh, is one of the reasons why uh, I have many reasons for loving this country, but I think that it really gave me so many opportunities. Uh, you know, returning to the APIA topic, uh, here in Silicon Valley, especially in Silicon Valley, there is this myth that, well, the story here is that uh, every Asian American is family is wealthy and their children are getting straight Not A's. Every week. Not well, every week. I, I know, and yeah. I know that. Yes. Uh, yes. And especially among new immigrants uh, and uh, other Asian groups like the Hmong uh, and um, other folks from Southeast Asia, they're really struggling and they have a hard time getting into college and staying in college. So one of the pieces of legislation that I passed was to help those people stay in college, to give those students additional support. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very proud of uh, uh, helping uh, anyone with education, but especially uh, young, low-income Asian Americans who are struggling. And you know, sometimes you do things that just affect one person, and you feel great about it, and it makes a difference to them, and uh, they feel really great about it, absolutely great. Uh, there was a man who flew C-47s, it was the DC-3s, uh, over the hump um, to fly uh, military supplies during World War II from India into China. And he, uh, as a pilot, there was a fire in the airplane and he was horribly burned, um, but he survived. Uh, he was really quite a hero. And he went on to live a quiet life in Oregon uh, as a postal clerk. Um, and um, I got a post office named after him. And you might think that naming a post office is wow. not that big a deal, mm -hmm. but when it's recognizing uh, unrecognized yeah, heroism right. mm -hmm. and the place where he worked, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, when we, when we uh, uh, awarded that to him, uh, you, know, you could just see um, how much of a difference it made to him. Mm. Your achievement is really impressive, but, uh, you know, when we search on internet and I found a negative news about you, mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, there is an unwanted sexual counter encounter with an 18-year-old uh, daughter of no, your friend. No, it was not 18. Uh, it, it, this, this, even those stories were not 18. So today we want to hear your version of story. What's the truth? <laughs> well, the thing is that um, the story is just untrue. Uh, it's absolutely untrue. Um, the accusation was false. It did not happen. Um, but I didn't fight it. Why? Beca because Why? I was fighting for custody of my children. Mm -hmm. I was going through a divorce that took oh. four years. Mm -hmm. um, and since uh, the woman made the story up, if I said, oh, um, you know, she's lying, mm -hmm. then she could potentially could make up a worse story and I could have my children taken away from me. As it turned out, uh, I stayed silent. The news stories are out there. They're incorrect. Uh, but I got custody of my children, and I raised them. I raised them well, and they're very successful young people. Uh, so, um, you know, um, so I, decided, you... I decided to uh, prioritize family. And, mm. uh, but, you know, how do you tell your children about this story? Because you cannot stop them from looking at internet? They know me, mm -hmm. and they uh, know that period of time, and they know it didn't happen. It didn't happen, but why she do that? I don't know. Um, I still don't know to this day. Uh, it's really, really hard to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that she is a, a somewhat troubled person, um, so it's just hard to uh, understand why. But, you know, you left something that you're really passionate about, your job. Um, so what do you do right now? Uh, I advise uh, young people about how to enter public office. Mm -hmm. And despite, you know, uh, the negative stories that never go away on the Internet. So what's which your, I, what's which your I, suggestion? Which, which I, well, and I hope that this, uh, this interview helps um, 
with a positive story on the internet. But anyway, more importantly, is encouraging young people to go into office. And I think I especially have some credibility, not only because I've served in Congress, but because some negative things happen and still believe very strongly uh, in public service. Uh, I'm, I've also written a book, um, and it's for uh, publication in China. Uh, and I advise foreign businesses making investments in the United States. Mm, well, that's wonderful. Actually, this show is called Innovation Dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, you served as the chair with the Innovation and Technology Committee, right? Yes, the Technology and Innovation Committee uh, of the Science Committee. And uh, uh, we supported a, a number of uh, uh, new technologies uh, developing and providing a base uh, standards for um, uh, technologic development, and it was very important. And it was very, very fun. So your story in 1999, become the first Chinese American congressman, is very impressive. So nowadays, you know, there are so many Asian American uh, immigrants become elected officials. So what's your suggestion to them? I think the most important thing is to build bridges uh, to everybody. You know, you're going to represent everybody in your community, mm -hmm. and you're running for election and need everyone's support. Mm -hmm. So you're not running as an Asian American, you're running uh, as an American building bridges to everybody else. Campaigns are hard. They are very, very hard, uh, and you need to be tough and rugged, mm -hmm. uh, you, but also, you should be nice. You should relate to people. Uh, I am uh, a, a strong belief mm. that if you're nice and people perceive you as nice, that's worth at least uh, four or five percentage points uh, in the vote on election day. Uh, nice people. So how do you like our president, Donald Trump? He's a very smart man, mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, in a word, I think he's crazy. <laughs> so, talking about the candidates, we have more than 20 candidates, right, from Dem Democrat. So, who can really, you know, beat him, or at least? Well, I think we have, what, 24 candidates yes, right now, yes. and there are going to be more coming out of the work, woodwork, which is... So why um, is that? Would, well, I think that uh, all these people think that if they become the nominee, yeah. they can beat Donald Trump. And I certainly hope that they can, uh, because I think that America can survive four years with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I think eight years would do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's important to let the democratic process uh, play out, the democratic process and the democratic party. Mm -hmm. I think the party, hopefully, will ultimately pick the strongest candidate. Uh, sometimes they do, mm -hmm. frequently they do, and sometimes they don't. Uh, you probably know that I'm a centrist by nature, so I tend to support centrist candidates, and we will see who shakes, sh who, uh, shakes out of that. Mm. So you went through this... Uh uh, you know, I would say up and down, uh, bumpers. So how to s handle the setbacks uh, for someone who wants to become an elected official? Right. I would l characterize both my life and my period of public service as almost all uh, very up, you know, very positive. And I would advise uh, people that uh, to keep a positive, optimistic attitude. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, hit the bumps, that uh, positive, optimistic attitude uh, is uh, very, very important to survive that. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have a thick skin because people are going to say all sorts of things about you. And some of them are unfair, some of them are untrue, but you just have to carry through and keep focused on the job. But how thick? As thick as you can possibly build it and uh, hopefully thicker than the s stones and arrows that they throw at you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I know that you, you've been helping the younger generations and very active in our community. So what do you see in the next five or 10 years our country should be? What I hope is that we um, move very strongly toward um, a better uh, rule of law. That is, we pay attention to our institutions um, that uh, create space for everybody to be free, for everybody to have privacy. Uh, that 
uh, we moved back into the international sphere where uh, there was an international order that the United States, um, primarily the United States, created after World War II. And that, that world order has kept the peace uh, since 1945. And this is the longest period of peace between the major powers uh, in the last thousand years that I could, you know, when I think back to it. And it's so very important because, you know, Donald Trump has been pulling us back from that. And quite frankly, uh, Bernie Sanders has also advocated for withdrawal from the world. Mm -hmm. And the United States historically has been a, a isolationist country. Mm -hmm. And if somebody convinces the American people to withdraw to our shores again, I don't think that we will um, be able to uh, sustain a peaceful world uh, for a long time to come. Um, we, we can make many improvements here in the United States. And uh, uh, not, not only do we need personal space and freedom, but we also need to support our poor and people who uh, cannot take care of themselves very well. But also um, the middle class, when something bad happens, need to make sure that they have enough support, uh, especially the opportunities to climb back up. Because we have not done uh, a good enough job of that. Finally, I think that one of the reasons why Donald Trump won, barely, you know, he won three states, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, by less than 100,000 votes, and all three states combined. So it was a bare margin over the whole country. He lost by 3.5 million votes. But he won in the uh, Midwest because we ignored working people who lost their jobs and had fallen upon hard times. So what and, we can do? Um, we need to focus on jobs that ordinary people can do because we can't tell them, hey, we're going to uh, re-educate uh, re you to become software engineers at age 50 mm -hmm. or you know, give up your community and move to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of things that we can do, like build roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just high tech. Mm -hmm. you know, some of it is bulldozers and backhoe. Mm -hmm. uh, and th those are high wage jobs that uh, uh, we can fund and we need the infrastructure that mm. those projects build. So David, last question. Will you run the elected official again? <laughs> you know, a democracy doesn't need any particular person. Um, mm. But it was the most engaging period of my time and I enjoyed public service. Uh, I know that uh, in life in general, you should never say always and never say never. But at this time, you know, I've really uh, done my time in public service. So it's not easy. It's very rewarding. Uh, and you hope you've had a chance to make a difference in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, I'm focused on that right now. You are making the difference of other people's life in a different ways right now. Thank you. Certainly trying to. Yes. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you.